Hello there, everyone. Welcome to Digital Nomad Mastery, the podcast and the video cast where we teach you how to make money while traveling the world. Speaking of traveling the world, we're currently in the northern Philippines and we'll be heading over to Manila uh, to do some speaking and you know, some workshops. So make sure you follow along our journey at daddyblogger.com. And as we're traveling, we love interviewing uh, fellow internet marketers on our show. And I have an amazing one on the show here today. His name is, I'm going to read out the bio here, David Summerfleck. Uh, he is the founder of DeFactor Digital and Sudden Impact Web Design. He is the author of five books, a former college professor, founder of two startups, an expert in digital marketing, SEO, website design, website development, social media, content marketing, Google AdWords, Facebook advertising, LinkedIn advertising, e-commerce, and traditional advertising. When I read that bio, I was like, I think we don't just need a 40-minute interview. I think we're going to need like a 24-hour interview because there's so much knowledge and wisdom and experience and expertise all about internet marketing and uh, you know all these things I just mentioned. So super excited to have David on the show here today. He's joining us from beautiful Fort Myers, Florida. David, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you doing? I am doing amazing. So David, uh, we always love to start our show by getting to know our guests. So why don't we sh hear your story before we get into marketing and advertising. We want to know you. Who is David? And tell us a little bit about your background. Well, basically, uh, my background really, I, I, I have a, as I was saying before we started, I have a, a degree in English with an emphasis in creative writing. That's always been my first love. Um, I love literature. I love, I even say it like a professor, literature. I've always loved reading. I've always loved uh, the creative arts. Uh, and basically my story, so to speak, uh, is really that I found that in order to make a living doing creative things, you have to be very adaptable. You've got to be very flexible and change with uh, changing environments and changing times and uh, kind of adapt, kind of like the Terminator. You have to really be able to adapt to different environments. Um, you know, and that, that's really my story in a nutshell is being flexible, learning how to change and adapt while still being very creative. Uh, and also learning from all of the jobs that I've had over all the years, all the places I've worked for, all the people I've worked with or, or, or for. Um, so I've worked for several agencies as a freelancer. I've worked for several agencies as an employee, um, you know, administering contracts, overseeing contracts, uh, digital marketing campaign rollouts, web design, marketing. And uh, I've learned a lot of general rules, basically, uh, in order to, to do what it is that you want to do. Awesome. So I don't, yeah, I don't want to talk too much. So that's, that's why I'm trying to, okay, you let me know when to, when to go on or I want to make sure that I don't, you know, we're too crazy. No, no. Talk as much as you want. We want to pick your brain. So uh, tell us a little bit about the specifics of your entrepreneurial ventures. So you met, uh, on your bio, I, I talked about earlier, you had two startups, you have five books, and you run multiple businesses now. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that, that entrepreneurial journey of yours. Well, basically, uh, I, my first business was um, I had a fascination with the law. I always, I've always admired lawyers and legal professionals, and I always tell them I have an enormous respect for the work that they do. Uh, it requires a tremendous amount of mental discipline and focus and education in a very narrow, specialized niche, which is why they command or should command what they do financially. Uh, but basically, you know. Uh, you know, I, I really couldn't afford to get into law school. My GPA really wasn't that great. Um, and so I got more involved in peripheral uh, uh, approaches. So I became a mediator, uh, which astounded me that so few people don't know anything about mediation um, and that it really has not caught on in, in most of America. Um, but anyway, I, you know, I learned about mediation. I became a mediator. I studied with several lawyers. I mediated uh, voluntarily through several courts so I could feel confident and experienced uh, in, in mediating uh, cases. Uh, 
So I started a mediation nonprofit organization uh, in Colorado where I was active with several court systems out there. And that lasted for a few years. And after a few years, I just, you know, I always remember my wife coming over and saying, you know, this is not fun. It's stressful. Nobody understands what it is or that it's available to them that, you know, rather than going to court and fighting in a very adversarial manner that's extremely expensive, uh, that they could resolve things uh, much more affordably, much more quickly through mediation. But I remember her bringing up the point that this just, as a business, this just wasn't really worth it. Uh, there's a cost-benefit analysis, and it just wasn't worth it. So she said, well, you know, if you're going to start a business, you want it to be something that you enjoy doing, that you can be the sole master or proprietor of, um, and, you know, I could get involved if I want to or if we work together, what have you. And I said, okay, let's put it, take it out behind the tool shed and put it to sleep, so to speak. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I started Sudden Impact Web Design. Um, and then very recently, um, I started a division of that called De Facto Digital to very, very specifically work with those in the legal professions who have a tremendous need for marketing and will tell you that um, based on my experience as a mediator and working within court systems and working with lawyers i felt very comfortable that i could understand the work that they did and the tools that they would need so that's kind of a general overview Awesome. So thank you for sharing your background. So I want to get into the meat and potatoes all about uh, advertising and marketing. You specialize, sure. yeah, you specialize in a range of different advertising, uh, everything from Google AdWords to Facebook ads, to LinkedIn ads. Tell us about like when a company works with you, how do you actually choose which type of marketing, which type of advertising is best for the company? Yeah, that's a, a, a very, very important question. Not every customer should be your customer. Not every client should be your client. And it sounds counterintuitive, but it's extremely right. If you look at uh, business, who you work with, who you work for, it's very similar to dating. If you date someone who has uh, bad habits or destructive habits or is abusive or, or puts you into tremendous debt, obviously it's not a good thing. And by the same token, we've all had jobs that we have felt very, very bad working in. That you know, you hear the terms that the job was a soul stealer. I hate going to work. I, I hate it. It pays very little. But they continue to go. So it's you know, you know that it's wrong. You know that it's not good for you. But you continue to do it anyway. And my point is, it's the same way working with clients. Um, and I hear this all the time. I'm also a business coach uh, because I found so many freelancers and startup founders and business owners uh, all have the same problem. It's, they'll tell you that my problem is different or my situation is unique, but it's not. It's the same problem. And you know what it is. I don't have to tell you. I need more clients. I need more business. My phone isn't ringing. I'm not getting enough clients. It's always the same. I had the owner of a private college uh, tell me that she wasn't getting enough students. Uh, I had a lawyer tell me he wasn't getting enough clients. Web designers aren't getting enough clients. On and on. They're all, they all have the same problem. But they're either not doing anything about it or they're doing destructive things. You know, it's like what Einstein said, if you want to, to keep getting the same results, to keep doing the same thing. If you want different results, do something different. Um, so for different clients, the approaches could vary, but the needs are always the same. It's always that way. So, uh, you know, I might, I spoke to a, a, a potential client recently at a nonprofit organization. And again, the problem is the same how you approach her, how you deal with her uh, might vary based on their personalities. And that's the Rubik's cube of it. Uh, so she has a nonprofit organization that is stymied. They're growing faster than she thought they would grow. Well, that's, 
with the website is an old website. It looks like a PowerPoint presentation. It has no SEO. Uh, there's no way for people to pay online, on and on and on. But you have to have a realistic budget to achieve these objectives. So the challenge is in communicating that to her in a way that, okay, I can handle this in very, very small increments because the amount of technical jargon and the amount of concepts that we're trying to introduce can be overwhelming to people who don't know anything about it. And the reality is most people don't know anything about it. Lawyers, doctors, dentists, accountants, they're not familiar with SEO. They may think they are because they read a tutorial or something or they saw a commercial, but they're not. So the challenge is in how you approach clients and tailor your specific solutions to them. It's in communication, which again goes back to mediation. So it's kind of like in bite-sized increments. Just like right now, I'm talking a mile a minute and I can be overwhelming. But if I break things into increments and have a, a, a structured outline or format, then it's more digestible, which is why I always use an outline when I talk to a client on the phone or I do a video chat like I'm doing with you now. I'll have a piece of paper outside of the camera range that will show me an outline of what we're talking about, why we're talking about it, and points. I'll tape uh, papers to the wall and I'll just talk to them. Oh, yes, sir, how can I help you? And I'm looking right mm -hmm. at that list. So I do that with podcasts. I'll do that. Uh, with uh, talking to clients. Um, so how you do it is the challenge of presenting the solution, but the solution is almost always the same. You need to, you need to hire an expert, you, you know, you need help. Are you willing to pay for help? You know, what's your budget range now? What's your budget number and kind of giving it to them in increments that they can handle. And, and I've learned to try to have multiple conversations. Uh, two or three conversations over the phone or by video before we meet in person, before we even think about working. Because I have to go through the steps of proposal. Uh, and I'm not going to do a proposal unless we talk a couple of times. And then the uh, contract. So, uh, you know, I, I broke that uh, format with this most recent cl potential client because I could see a lot of drama. And I just felt, I'm not really sure if I want to work with this uh, lady because of the inherent drama that could be there. You know, small budget, a lot of requirements, kind of controlling personality. This is telling me there's a lot of fear there. So I wasn't really sure if I wanted to work with her. So I gave her the proposal and the contract at the same time. And I knew exactly what was going to happen before I did it. Just in retrospect, I probably should have said, look, slow your roll. We need to have two or three 15, 20 minute conversations before we can decide whether or not to work together. When your emotions take charge and kind of you lose focus at times. So even though I do have a lot of experience, I still make mistakes, but I'll look at the mistake that I've made and try to learn from it. I'm not perfect. Nobody is, but that's basically my process. But to answer your question, there's so many different tools. There's so many different businesses. We want to focus on the problems that we're solving and the value that we're bringing to the client. The tools that you use, how you do it, is really irrelevant. It's not, in my opinion, it's not something to go over with the client. Any more than if I were to go to the dentist and tell them, look, I want you to use this type of enamel because I know it's cheaper and I want you to fill my teeth with this type of material because it can save me money and on and on. And, and I actually, I had a really good dentist uh, a couple years ago. He just graduated from dental school, really young guy, you know, all jacked up into, into weightlifting and everything. And it helped him deal with the stress and focus on it. And I asked him, do you get uh, DIY clients, just like web developers and digital marketers. He said, oh yeah, he said people wouldn't believe it. But he said, yeah, I've had paper people come in and use paper clips to, you know, put crowns back on their teeth and they would fill their teeth with, you know, super glue or whatever. And he's like, you wouldn't believe it. But he's like, yeah, I've seen it. And he even told me if you go on Amazon, they have a do-it-yourself, you know, root canal kit. 
And I looked and he was right. So we all have the same problems. It's how we deal with them. And I've learned over decades of doing web design since the 90s that the more technical the work is, the less you want to explain the tools to the clients. You want to focus in on solving the problem, focusing in on what's the weight of this problem. How does it really impact you and your family and your business? And you have to go over that in order for them to truly value the solution that you're providing. So, you know, to use the dental analogy, if I need a root canal, uh, if anybody out there has ever had one done, it hurts. The, the nerve is exposed uh, to the air. So uh, depending on the injury, it can, it, the pain can be quite severe. You're willing to go to the dentist. You want to go see what, someone who knows what they're doing. You may want to look at the billing. But it's not something where you, oh, let me go home and think about it for a couple of days or let me ask my girlfriends or, or I don't know if your price is too high or whatever. You need the solution and you will pay what is a realistic, you know, wage uh, to have that, solu that, that problem fixed. But anyway, I'm kind of digressing. But you want to focus in on solving high ticket problems high value problems for real businesses. And once you focus more on qualifying clients, you have less drama. Now, not to say that I don't have drama, because obviously I do, as I just described. Um, so I'm always refining that. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, David. So I want to cover some of these areas of marketing and advertising, uh, especially the area of SEO and uh, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, Google ads. Those are the, the top ways, obviously. Let's cover SEO first. I mean, that's a hot topic and almost every business owner wants to be ranked at the top of Google. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we all get these emails. Okay, the gurus pay us, you know, X number of dollars and we'll get you to the top of Google in one month, right? We all get those emails. So yeah. tell, tell us about how do you actually really get someone in the top of Google what are your top strategies to do that there's a lot to, that I can talk about in this category so I'm gonna ask you to keep me in track okay sure sure uh, keep me in line so I don't digress too much but yeah it's early here it's l later in the evening where you are so I'm, I've had enough caffeine but I'm older it doesn't kick in that fast but basically SEO Google Ads Facebook ads these are tools people fixate and obsess over the tools and especially you know potential clients will obsess over the tools and not the desired outcomes that they want to reach if if you know you might see a, a attractive uh, person you want to date we're not thinking about are they relationship material it's kind of the same thing uh, i've had clients call and say how much is google I really have had that with how much is SEO um, as if they're buying, you know, a cheeseburger or something, you know, at McDonald's. Um, there's no one solution that I can take you and make you number one in Google, or I can take you and promote your business on Facebook ads and you're going to get a million phone calls. It's not magical, non-technical clients will think it is magical because they don't have a technical understanding. We have to, again, like mediation, provide the information to the clients in bite-sized chunks that they can handle. It's very non-technical where you focus in on achieving desired outcomes and meeting the business objectives. And if they don't have the need, which is a real business making money that's struggling, that they're not going to value it and their budget is going to be very, very low and they're going to be very demand, a lot of stress, a lot of drama. So SEO, search engine optimization. Look, there's only really one search engine out there right now. We all know that. And it's Google. Bing is used predominantly, in my opinion, based on what I've read by older uh, people, uh, older Americans who use they get their, their laptop or their PC, and it comes with Internet Explorer baked into it. They have to use Bing because they're not familiar with Google uh, and DuckDuckGo or, or whatever. So they're going to use what's available to them by default. They're not going to be familiar with other browsers. They're going to use Internet Explorer because they're just not aware of it. So you tell them all this stuff, and it really is going to go one ear and out the other. It's just like a doctor 
telling you all this technical jargon that we don't understand. That's why they don't do it. They talk about outcomes. Would you like to have the pain go away? Would you like a cure to your illness? That's what you talk about. Would you like more clients? Yes, I would. Okay, do you have a business? Do, do you know how much do you really need this? What's this value to you? I can take you there, but it's going to cost you several thousand dollars to get started. And then this is a service. It's not a one-stop physical item you're buying. You have to tell them these things. Um, so, I mean, I've had, I have had clients that I could take to number one in Google. Their market was such that it had openings. Um, so you could do that. I could strategically put them to the top of Google uh, and do it in a short period of time. If you're in a small town where there's not a lot of uh, competition for particular terms, it's very easy to do. And it's, it's shocking to me. I'm not an SEO guru by any means. I am not Yoast, okay, who is an SEO guru. Everybody knows Yoast. Um, I'm not as brilliant as he is, but it is shocking if you get on the internet and just look up lawyers, for example, because I work with lawyers, how many of them have no SEO at all. They think they know what it is, uh, and they may know what, you know, a search engine optimization but their website has none. And they'll tinker with their website for years and years and years trying to do it themselves and simply not get any leads through the site. And it's the same with many, many other business owners. Um, and it all comes down to the value to them. If it's worth, is this worth investing a couple thousand dollars for you to be number one in Google? What does that mean for you? Um, and that's kind of what you want to break down. If that makes sense, um, there's so many different tools for to reusing SEO. There's so many different ways to advertise on Facebook ads and tools to monitor it and Google Analytics. Um, so yeah, it's you want to tell your clients, you know, we can make you number one in Google. We don't know how long it's going to take. We can't give you a, a cost like you're buying, you know, uh, a Happy Meal or something. But what's more important is it's going to cost a, thousand, a couple of thousand dollars to get started. We know that. It's going to be an ongoing uh, service. It's not, you know, it begins here and it ends here. It's a regular recurring service that must continue. So we're going to need a couple of thousand dollars to get started. And then there's going to be regular recurring maintenance of the site and the, the, the different uh, updates and, and tools and so on. In Google AdWords, when you stop paying for Google AdWords, you go down, depending on the competition. So, for example, I have a client who uh, is an optician. Now, they're number one in Google for their city and state for optician. And it was a very little effort for me to do that because I know what I'm doing. So I shouldn't say it was very little effort. It was something I could do easily enough because I knew how to do it. It took me a couple of hours to set them up. They're number one in Google for optician in their city and state. They don't know it. They have no way to value it. It means nothing to them because they don't understand what SEO is. And if they're number one in Google, it doesn't mean anything to them because they're an older couple. They're very nice people, but they're, they're an older couple. They don't look at Google. They don't understand how it works. And it means nothing to them. So, you know, you, I could tell them, you know, look, I made you number one in Google. How many more referrals are you getting as a result of that? They don't know. And they have no way of understanding and kind of putting it in different concepts. Um, so it really was something that I did more as a digital marketing person who wanted to do right by them, wanted to do a good job for them, they wanted to be able to. Uh, basically brag about that in my portfolio and say, look, I have a beautiful custom website I built for them, but they're also number one in Google um, on top of that. And then look at all these other things we did to build their business related into the website as a part of the digital marketing service. Um, but for a client who is in a more competitive market, like a lawyer, very competitive, uh, you take a 10 mile radius, how many lawyers are going to be every 10 miles in the U S probably two or three lawyers for every square mile of any city. Uh, they're very competitive. You could take that's, 
you know, take the lawyer and make them number one in Google for their type of law practice and their zip code is going to be much more work. You're going to have to pay for Google ads and Facebook ads to get them the results they want. But they have a low budget. It's anything really less than five grand. Is it really worth your time? Is it going to be worth the money that you're going to have to pay out to Google ads and Facebook ads and all the hours that's going to take you? These are all things you want to think about. Sorry to digress there. No, thank you for sharing. Um, one of the hot areas of advertising nowadays is obviously Facebook. Uh, uh, most people are either wanting to get on or on, and a lot of people struggle to do Facebook ads themselves oh, yeah. uh, because you know uh, they just don't have the experience and expertise. So, how, how, yeah. uh, what are your tips for Facebook advertising in this day and age? To learn about it. Facebook advertising, just like Google AdWords, it's, you know, it's, it's really deceptive. Uh, the clients, and I'm not saying the clients are bad people. They're business owners who have a need. The need is to promote the business and get more clients for them. There's nothing wrong with that. That's beautiful. We like that. We want to be able to help them, and we want them to come to us. The problem is that the work that we do, if you're a digital nomad, if you're a web developer, programmer, digital marketing guy who oversees the big picture like me, it's very technical work. And they're always changing and updating their algorithms. So you could say that you're very experienced in Facebook ads, and then they're going to change their, their interface so that what was there before isn't there now. Um, I went to Udemy, or Udemy, however you pronounce it, U-D-E-M-Y.com. I took every free course I could find in Facebook advertising and Google AdWords, and Google Analytics. I still have a couple hundred that I'm signed up for. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love to learn. I recommend everybody go to Udemy, sign up for all the free courses that interest you, and do one per week. Everybody has a couple hours you know, per day or, you know, two or three hours per day, you can get it on your phone. Uh, granted, yeah, it's not great on your phone. Um, and, uh, you know, anybody at Udemy, I wish you guys would get it in your head to create a channel on Roku. It would make you so much more freaking money. But that's marketing. You can't make people do what's good for them. Uh, but I would say take free courses and just freaking study and learn. Um, but it's very time consuming. It's very technical. And what it comes down to is time management. For people who really have real businesses that make money, that support a family, that pay a mortgage, these people don't have five or six hours per day to tinker with websites or try to learn programming or go and do all these tutorials and basically try to learn a new skill to run a side business. That's why most businesses that are legitimate businesses that try the do-it-yourself approach to marketing and digital, they don't succeed. And I remember the Small Business Administration of the U.S. government said somewhere around 90, somewhere between 90 and 99% of all new businesses fail within their first three years. And I think that the within before five years, that number increases to something like 99% of all new businesses will go under within five years. It's a, a wild number. I mean, that's incredible. That's more than most. You know, that's almost every single new business is going to be dead within five years. As a web developer, as a marketing guy, I don't want to be associated with businesses that are going to be gone in a couple of years. How does that look for my portfolio? You know, I did a website for a guy who had a, um, it was like a secondhand antique shop. Uh, that was like, you know, you could go in and you could browse antiques and you could buy things and barter and sell there and what have you. And it was a humongous store, it was gigantic. You could literally house uh, an entire family in this, this building. It was enormous. And he, he wanted a website and his budget was incredibly low. And I looked at the store and just said, there's no way in the world we could get even a quarter of these items in your website, scanned in there, plugged into a customer relationship management tool or CRM, hook it into a CMS, 
customer man, co uh, excuse me, content management system like WordPress or Joomla or Drupal and do all of this work for a few hundred bucks. It has no value to you. You see no value in it. It's not for me. I don't want to do something like that. And long story short, a couple years later, the store is no longer there. What a surprise. What a surprise. So, you know, uh, we see all these bright, shiny objects, and, and that's what the clients see. That's what the non-technical people see. And even technical programmers and developers and web designers, we see all the new tools, all the new updates that are coming out. Um, it's very easy to get distracted. We want to be informed. We need to be updated and current. But at what point do you say, I need to be I need to know the new procedures and the new tools coming out, but I want to focus more for me. I want to focus more business and getting more high value clients who value what I can do for them and not spend 10 hours a day studying the new algorithm or studying Gutenberg or why does not Drupal? Why can't they be competitive with, with this or Joomla? Why are they so behind and all these other tools that might equate them and, you want to stop tinkering and start working with more clients, really. You know, um, I think it's very, very easy to get lost amidst all the bright, shiny objects and tools and not be talking to clients who have real needs. There's so many millions of businesses out there in the world, so many millions of websites that genuinely, truly suck, that do a disservice to them that aren't making them a penny in revenue, that aren't getting any publicity at all. If you have technical skills, you could be helping people. So instead of studying the latest tutorial on how to make your, your site do this a certain way or have an image, have this animation or tint, you want to focus more on achieving business objectives than uh, you know, the most beautiful website. I know a lot of developers who make very, very big incomes. And their websites are really quite basic. Really, really quite basic. There's a millionaire uh, real estate developer I was looking at his website the other day. He's a millionaire real estate investor um, in New York. And he seems like a, a legitimately nice person. I've seen him on TV. Uh, but his website, by technical standards, is actually quite basic and rudimentary. Um, the images, the design, they're all very, very basic. Um, but he focuses on, it's easier to manage it, it's easier to update it, it's easier to have the SEO and plug it into all these social media distribution channels, and it's easier for people to understand. So that's really what we want to focus in on, what we should want to focus in on as digital nomads. And again, I'm not saying I'm perfect at these things or I always do what I say. I don't. I make mistakes. Um, I have a, a, a personal website that I'm not, at I'm not at all happy with. I started it showing off technical ability. And it looks pretty crazy. Uh, I like some of it. I don't like some of it. And honestly, I will change it and make it more simple and more basic in order to attract more high-end clients so I can talk more about value and, and who I want to work with in less on flashy images, if that makes sense. So I know I'm kind of wandering around and digressing again, but the point is to work, look at the big picture and not the tools, I think. That's what I'm trying to say. Sounds good, David. Uh, so we've covered Google, we've covered Facebook. Uh, I'd love to cover LinkedIn because, uh, you know, obviously it's a great tool for entrepreneurs and business owners. And I think most people are yeah. not, not as familiar with LinkedIn advertising as they are with Google ads and Facebook ads. LinkedIn, um, you know, advertising, I haven't personally used it myself. So why don't you tell us how it works, uh, you know, as opposed to Google and Facebook? How does LinkedIn advertising work? Well, thank you for, for the question. And, you know, honestly, I've gotten more referrals lately, just like in the last week or two, using LinkedIn and Facebook as well. Um, basically, it's trying to, and not, not trying to, but starting conversations with people that I would like to work with or I see they need help. 
So, um, and that's really the key uh, with advertising. You can invest in advertising, but you want to try to start conversations and break through this noise. The what I call the dead calm, because so much of social media and advertising is look at this, do this. There's no real the humanity of it is fading. You know, we if you go to networking groups, you want to build connections with people. You want to start conversations, not just say, hi, what do you do? Here's my card, call me. They won't call you. Uh, you want to talk about value again. So I, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn has a new service that I've actually gotten some, some uh, very nice business coaching clients through. And I never really thought of myself as a business coach, but I just thought, you know, look, after working for hundreds of businesses through the years, through the decades, um, and also consulting with them through SCORE, um, a division of the Small Business Administration, it gave me the confidence that I could advise just about any type of business. And um, I saw people asking these, the, the same questions over and over again on LinkedIn and these forums. And so I started saying, look, I can help you, but... I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you a few hours of my time for free. I'm just not going to do it anymore. My time has value to me. I could be working on a book. I could be building a website for a client. I could go get a regular job. So why should I work for free? And the people are going to give you their own drama and grief along with it. So, um, you know, I would just find people on Facebook forums, offer to help them and just say, go to my calendar page pay my fee and I'll help you on an hourly basis as a business coach, right? Now I've got other packages to move them into if there's a good fit. Uh, the same thing with LinkedIn. One of the great things LinkedIn has, and I hope that they uh, continue, is I think it's called uh, LinkedIn Mentor or something like Mentor, Business Advisor or Coach or something like that, where people will post questions on LinkedIn where they need business advice or business input. And you can offer to do this for them. It seems wonky because I'm not getting email notifications when people post new questions or problems on this service. And LinkedIn does seem to be pretty slow because I've noticed people will send me messages through LinkedIn uh, Messenger. And I don't get a notification email until like the day after. Um, and this is through Gmail. But um, yeah, LinkedIn has a lot of hidden tools. And again, I recommend everybody go to Udemy, sign up for whatever free courses they have about LinkedIn marketing. And you know, if there's not that many good ones, pay $10 and take a couple if you can. Um, just find everything that you can on YouTube and Udemy and Coursera and all these other free uh, course websites. Teachable is another. And so I use LinkedIn, uh, like I said, to actively recruit uh, business coaching clients to find uh, appropriate clients for my digital marketing business, to uh, try to talk to lawyers on why they need to take marketing seriously. And I, I have to say the great irony with so many lawyers is to the typical lawyer, okay, one new client for them could be worth anywhere from $10,000 to $30,000 or more. Because you don't know what the client's issue could be. You don't. It could be a divorce, could be business litigation, could be very, very costly. If you've ever been to court with a lawyer, you know it's very costly. And yet, the overwhelming majority of them, they don't want to spend anything on internet marketing. I don't understand it. Uh, but I think it's because of what they do is so technical and such a very, very highly specialized niche that digital marketing just either seems overwhelming or perfunctory. It's something anyone can do or teenagers do, or I'll get my nephew to do it. He's good at Excel. Those, those types of things. It may be a case of overwhelm. You're not seeing the value in it. I'm sure that's the case, but it, 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 it truly, uh, you know, saddens me because I see people who spent so much time and so much of their own money and have so much debt to get this knowledge, but they're not doing everything that they could to market themselves. 
it's the same for any service provider uh, that you spent so much time and energy learning your skill. You know, isn't it worth trying to advertise it and promote it to get new leads? You know, if you can afford a new suit or going out for a meal, you know, or a trip somewhere, you know, don't eat out for 90 days. Don't go to Starbucks for 90 days. Take that money and invest it in marketing to get more leads. But it's, well, it's also a matter of planning for the future. It's investing in something that you may not immediately see. And I think that's the real, the big sell that we as digital marketers have to tell clients. You may not see immediate results with this. It may take 90 days for you to reach the top of Google or what have you, but it, the results will be amazing. And you have to be able to show them the science behind it. Um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. I think it's very nice. I encourage everybody out there in digital nomad land. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. You know, I'm the bald guy who likes blue. You can, you know, David Summerfleck, S-O-M-E-R. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm very easy to find. Um, and I'm always uh, interested in getting into conversations with people on LinkedIn and learning about their business objectives and business goals. And I'm always happy to help out with one or two quick questions. Um, and just like any other digital marketing or web designer or SEO person out there, help, but don't work for free. Value the work that you do so that the clients will value you and that you can better take care of your family and, and uh, your, your life as well. There's no reason really for people to be so unhappy with their businesses and unfulfilled. You just have to be willing to take the initiative. Well said, my friend. So you've already, Back to you. <laughs> you've already told us how to connect with you on LinkedIn. Uh, so in conclusion, how can people uh, connect you through your personal website, your business website? Uh, people might want to hire you for some uh, marketing and adv uh, advertising. Uh, so tell us about the different ways that people can reach out and connect. Absolutely. Um, I have a Google Voice number. Well, here I am getting technical again, and I'm telling people not to do it. You can call me out there in Webland. You can call me at 424-DAVID-01, 424-DAVID-01. Um, if you are a spammer, uh, it won't do you any good to call me. Um, you can send me a million text messages through that number. It won't do you any good. Uh, it's for legitimate people who have money-making businesses who want to make more money or businesses in need of growing and are willing and interested in investing realistic money to give back realistic returns and grow. Um, so 424-DAVID-01, uh, you can always, Sudden Impact Web Design, you can always look that up, um, it is at siwd.co. And again, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, um, like I said, I'm always interested and willing to help people legitimately uh, with one or two quick questions and try to point them in the, in the right direction. Uh, you know, I do believe in karma and I do believe in trying to be a good person. Um, I think what we do comes back. Um, that being said, uh, you know, we, if, if you're a business person, you have to be a business person. So, you know, uh, I'm always happy to help people, but I've seen so many times with the startups and people working online who will, will do more than they should and really invest themselves emotionally um, and just spend much, much more time for free or something like that. It's not fair for people to ask you to really give of themselves and not be willing to pay. But anyway, 424-David01, SIWD.co, and de facto digital if you're a lawyer or legal services provider. Beautiful. Well, th thank you, David, for sharing your insights here today in terms of the whole uh, uh, marketing area and then, of course, Google ads, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads. Uh, thank you for your time. It was great to connect with you here on the podcast. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and for having me on your show, and, and I appreciate the kindness. I appreciate your insights. Uh, so I'll have those links below. Uh, if you're watching this interview on YouTube, they'll be right in the YouTube description. If you're listening on iTunes or one of the podcast directories, they will be right in the show notes. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, and tune in uh, for the next episode for my Digital Nomad Mastery podcast.
హలో దేవ్